morning. Can you hear me? Fine. All right. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for today's seminar, Cardiovascular Effects of Multipollutant Exposure, Mechanisms and Interactions. So our speaker today for the main seminar is going to be Dr. Mike Kleinman, and he was the principal investigator for this study. My name is Lori Miyasato, and along with Pat Wong, I helped to uh, manage this contract. So before we launch into the main seminar, I'm going to give a brief introduction. Next slide, please. Oh, is there a... Uh, oh, okay. All right, but before I do that, I need to do some housekeeping announcements. So for those of us who are joining the webinar, questions for the speaker can be sent to the email address on your screen, sierrarm at calepa.ca.gov. And we encourage you to do that while the seminar is in progress to make sure your uh, co comments and questions are received in a timely manner. For those of us who are here today in the, in the audience, um, for anyone who's not familiar with the building, there are restrooms right here on the second floor. Go out the main double doors that you came in through, make a left, and take another left turn at the green glass chandelier. On the first floor, we also have a cafeteria and ATM for your convenience. And in the event of a fire alarm, which we've been having quite a few of in the recent past, please proceed out the same door as you entered, go down the stairs, and go out the main, main doors um, at 10th and I, the uh, southwest corner of the building. Proceed in an orderly, orderly fashion across uh, 10th and I streets to Cesar Chavez Park, and please assemble there and await further instructions. For additional information about today's speaker, as well as slides and other material, you can check at the URL on the slide below. Okay. So now for a little bit of background. Fine particulate matter, or PM2.5, and ozone are common air pollutants in California. Both have been linked to health problems, including heart and lung disease. However, air pollutants such as PM and ozone do not occur in isolation. So for example, if you walked out outdoors today and you started experiencing some sort of health problems, it would be really hard to determine what the individual pollutant or pollutants that are responsible for your symptoms are because it's all present in a big mixture. And many of the exposure studies that have been conducted have only looked at individual pollutants. So as a result, very little is known about the combined effects of PM2.5 and ozone. So what might happen if we were exposed to a mixture of pollutants? What I'm gonna show here on the slide is very simplified. Uh, so this is probably not your actual real world situation. However, I'd like to point out on the y-axis, the vertical axis, is a health impact. This might be related to heart symptoms or other endpoints, and we're going to assume that an increasing value uh, represents a worsening of the symptom. So on the x-axis, the first couple of bars on the left are for the pollutants in isolation, whereas on the right-hand side, we have mixtures of those pollutants. So as you see for on the left, pollutant A and pollutant B, each on their own, are, are associated with some sort of health impact. Now, as far as when they're combined, so the middle bar shows what happens if this is one possibility. So it may be a simple additive effect where the effects of the pollutants in isolation just combine and to basically add up to the effect seen there. But it is also possible that there would be interactions between these pollutants. So for example, the fourth bar 
uh, this is referred to as a synergistic interaction. The health impact is amplified beyond what either pollutant alone would produce. Conversely, the far right-hand bar shows an interaction in which the health response drops with respect to the initial pollutants, and that can be considered an antagonistic interaction. And again, these are very simplified um, effects. There are a lot of variables that uh, could change these. For example, the levels of the pollutants, um, the time duration or timing of exposure, and a number of other variables. So again, this is very simplified. But uh, just to reiterate, we know very little about the effects of mixtures. And so for today's talk, Dr. Kleiman will be exploring what happens if you have this mixture of pollutants to help address this gap in the scientific knowledge. So now for an introduction of our speaker today, Dr. Michael Kleinman. He is a professor in environmental health sciences at the University of California, Irvine. He is also co-director of the Air Pollution Health Effects Laboratory in UCI's Department of Medicine. He is currently the chairman of the scientific review panel on toxic air contaminants, and he has to his name over 100 peer-reviewed publications related to air pollutants and their effects. His current studies deal with the role of organic and inorganic particulate matter constituents and ozone in heart disease. And we will be hearing more about this, some of these recent studies today in his talk. So without further ado, I'd like to um, welcome Dr. Michael Kleinman. Thank you, Lori. <clears throat> Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I am going to, you know, present uh, data. This uh, project, the uh, cardiovascular effects of multi-pollutant exposure, is a quite large project involving a lot of uh, people that helped make this work. And I just wanted to start out by uh, thanking. Uh, uh, Andrew, uh, David, Rebecca, Lisa Wingen, and uh, a slew of other people who really put in time to help uh, work on these projects. Uh, the exposures I'm going to describe are very time and labor intensive, and people had to put in a lot of uh, work with a lot of dedication. Uh, you know, the mice really don't care if you want to go on a holiday or whatever, they've got to be exposed. And they get quite testy if we don't uh, keep to our schedule. They're very rigid about that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is as we go through this, uh, obviously, we, we generated an awful lot of data. I am trying to summarize that uh, down to some of the key uh, findings. There'll be a lot of details that I'll gloss over, and I'll be happy to stand here and answer questions <laughs> and fill in gaps that you notice, uh, because I can talk uh, indefinitely. So uh, I'm yours for the day. Uh, so uh, I'm going to, you know, just briefly talk about, uh, you know, how we got involved in this project and why uh, we felt it was important. I'll go over our overall uh, approach. Um, there were some uh, findings that we really didn't intend to find. We didn't, you know, think we would find anything, but we actually have some data that are relevant to effects of climate change. And so I thought that was an important, unanticipated co-benefit of this study. And so I've got uh, you know, just a smidgen of data on that. We're going to look into it more, more closely. But uh, just something to give you a hint of uh, 
another reason we need to you know, be concerned about uh, our impact on the environment. We'll uh, talk about uh, you know, the particles of interest and particularly we're gonna work on the, uh, or discuss the cardiovascular effects. So um, EPA in its last review uh, of uh, particulate matter uh, had begun a program of deciding whether the data that were pre, you know, available uh, proved that there was a likely causal relationship or a possible causal relationship, but down to we can't really tell you one way or the other. Uh, for the for particulate air pollution, uh, the evidence was very convincing that there is a likely causal relationship between exposure to elevated levels of PM 2.5 and uh, cardiovascular disease, as well as total uh, uh, non-accidental mortality. So uh, that was an important uh, finding because these are based on epidemiological studies and it takes an awful lot to convince epidemiologists that, you know, especially with environmental studies where uh, you are observing changes in, in real people with a lot of variability uh, that you can identify something that you think meets the test of being causal. Uh, this study uh, came up over a period of years as we've been studying the effects of air pollution on health. And we were doing an exposure study uh, and we actually took our mice to Riverside and set up in a field study situation in a place where we had uh, very high concentrations of airborne particles. And we did uh, a bunch of uh, measurements and got in touch with Suzanne Paulson, who's also studying air pollution in LA. And what she brought to the table was the ability to measure peroxides and free radicals in the air and at ozone, we thought it would be kind of interesting to look at, you know, her measurements and see if they had any relationship to what we were seeing. And as it turned out, when she uh, published her data, she found a very strong correlation between ambient ozone and our changes in blood pressure and heart rate changes, which was really intriguing because the way we do our exposures, as I'll show you, we actually scrub the ozone out of the system. So ambient ozone never uh, was seen by the animals, even though the ambient ozone correlated better with our health signal than some of the particulate measures we were doing, which led us to uh, ask the question, is there something different about the particles that are made during periods when you have high photochemical activity, more ozone formation, more peroxides, and could those reactions have led to the development of more toxic particles? So that was sort of in the background of what we decided to study. However, we can't control ambient conditions and you know, it would be difficult to plan an experiment just to do that. And it probably would have been even more difficult to convince ARB to give us funding for it. Mm -hmm. So what we proposed was to add that as another question to be answered but the main thrust of the study would be a controlled study of particles mixed with ozone, and we would compare that to the particles alone, to the ozone alone, and the mixture, and then try to understand uh, you know, what is the effects of 
you know, doing this. And as uh, Lori showed uh, earlier, there are several different ways this interaction could go. It could, you could have additive or synergistic effects. You could have interference effects. We found both. <laughs> we found all of the above, which is interesting. But as we start going through the data, we're beginning to understand, well, why in this circumstance are we seeing an interaction that drives the effects down and other interactions that increase them? And hopefully, uh, I'll be able to convince you that you know, some of this data actually makes sense, even though if you take isolated bits, it would seem to be counterintuitive. So some of the things we'll be looking at are uh, changes in the plaques that form in the arteries, because we know that air pollution, especially particulates, are associated with uh, cardiovascular disease, including atherosclerosis. And so we're using a model animal that will spontaneously develop plaques in the arteries. We're trying to hedge our bets to some extent but they turn out to be a reasonably good surrogate for looking at a compromised human population. We are measuring a phenomenon called heart rate variability, which is actually the analysis of the interval between normal heartbeats. As you go through your day, your heart beats uh, vary. Sometimes they speed up, sometimes they slow down. And this is very important to keeping you alive. You know, when you start exercising, you want your heart rate to go up. You want your body to be able to control those phenomena. And so we can measure various things related to that uh, variation. And it turns out when you look at epidemiological data, uh, <clears throat> Changes in heart rate variability are often uh, associated with worsening cardiovascular health. So it's really important to uh, look at that. And the other advantage to that is the way we do our experiment, we can actually measure this on a minute by minute basis during exposures, after exposures, and over long periods of time. So this gives us a, a, a continual endpoint that we can now correlate with the air pollution data that we're collecting. And we know what the animals are being exposed to. And there are uh, variations because we use real world particles. And therefore, we will see real world variation in particle concentration over time. So we're going to ask the question of you know, whether these two materials, ozone and PM, uh, acting in concert can produce uh, outcomes that are different than what you would see with them acting alone. So there are lots of mechanisms by which we know ambient uh, PM uh, can cause health effects. And a number of them, I'm going to use the, the, the marker. And I think you can see it. OK. So we're going to uh, look at uh, the idea that you breathe in ambient particles. And when they come into the lung, they can cause uh, pulmonary inflammation, which can then lead to systemic inflammation, oxidative stress, uh, changes in the function of arteries, uh, changes in platelet activation, and all of these things relate to the development of atherosclerosis and the progression of plaque. Eventually, this could lead to instability of the plaque, and then the plaque can rupture and throw out clots. Uh, which can then cause heart attacks, or uh, you can activate the platelets and they form uh, clots 
uh, in various locations wherever blood might stagnate, and then those clots might be released and cause an MI. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the nerves in the lung and uh, are also triggered by these inflammatory changes. These can affect autonomic nervous system changes, and those change the way your heart uh, beat responds to daily events. So this can change heart rate rhythms, ultimately could lead to uh, arrhythmias. And as I mentioned, we do measure uh, you know, the electrocardiograms. And so this also changes not only rhythm, but we'll be able to see uh, changes in the actual waveform, which is our typical things that uh, we look at in humans uh, when, we, when they're being examined for cardiovascular disease. And so we're able to do a lot of the same kinds of measurements in our mice. So uh, the framework uh, in terms of thinking was that uh, the interaction between the ozone and PM uh, could be extrinsic in that uh, ozone can act on the particles themselves uh, and change uh, the bioavailability of metal components, oxidize the organic constituents, uh, activate the particle surfaces so that they are more likely to uh, react with other molecules, and also enhance formation of free radicals. So these things can then propagate through this uh, uh, scheme and activate uh, various elements of the inflammatory process, uh, create uh, <clears throat> acute phase proteins by activating mm -hmm. the liver, change coagulability of uh, the blood cells, uh, eventually uh, relate to uh, atherosclerotic plaques, plaque uh, could rupture and cause these things. Uh, we don't get down to uh, this part of the mechanism. So we'll be looking primarily at, uh, you know, these earlier uh, changes. But within the body, uh, when you inhale ozone, the other thing that ozone can do when it's inhaled by itself is oxidize lipids and proteins in lung fluid, uh, increase the lung permeability to promote inflammatory processes, augment toxic effects induced by inhaled particles. And when the lung permeability and the tight junction barriers that keep fluids and air separate in your lungs uh, is changed. It provides an opportunity for ultrafine particles, the ultrafine component of PM 2.5, to actually migrate out and have potentially direct effects on the vasculature and the heart. Now that's something we hypothesize. We're still trying to find a really good way of finding evidence of those particles actually out there. And we have dreams of being able to do that, but so far we've not figured out a really good way to do it. So our overall approach is uh, we take these atherosclerosis-prone mice, uh, we expose them to PM 2.5, and what we do for that is, as I'll show you, is we concentrate the ambient PM. The ambient PM is, uh, in fact, concentrated by about tenfold over uh, the ambient, the normal ambient level. So our mice are seeing an elevated level of uh, concentrated ambient particles or caps. 
Uh, we have another arm of the experiment where the caps is mixed with 200 ppb or 0.2 ppm of ozone, which is a, a high level for ambient levels now, but not unusual level when I first moved to California in, in the late 70s. So these, these are numbers that people have experienced and uh, you know, on, on really bad days during, uh, you know, severe episodes, there can be short-term uh, expo ex uh, experiences of uh, levels that high. <clears throat> so we looked at the uh, caps with 200 ppm ozone, uh, 200 ppb ozone, and 200 ppb of ozone alone. So we looked for joint effects, and the separate effects of the pollutants. It's important to keep in mind that we talk about PM 2.5 as, as an entity. In reality, PM 2.5 is a distribution of particles, and the particles range in size from basically molecular sized clumps, let's say 10 nanometers, up to the larger particles, which are 2,500 nanometers or 2.5 microns. But the ultrafine uh, fraction, the, part, the number of particles less than 100 nanometers or 0.1 microns, uh, those particles make up a relatively small fraction of the mass of the PM 2.5, but an overwhelmingly large number of the particles. So as a number distribution, the majority of particles are smaller than 100. And in fact, in our area, just measuring the, the size distribution of particles uh, in uh, PM, just around our lab, we see uh, most of the particles by number uh, at around uh, 60 or 70 nanometers. So even though our exposures uh, are, are PM 2.5, and we have a, a particle size cut at that level, the majority of the particles are really, you know, in the ultrafine particle range. So, and this is typical for most sites in Southern California. If you look at the PM 2.5, a major contribution to the number of particles is going to be from this ultrafine component. The ultrafines are important because they have a very high surface area to volume ratio. So even though they represent a small fraction of the mass, they represent a, an important fraction of the total surface area of particles that you breathe in and then can deliver other associated chemicals along with it. So it's an important thing to keep in mind that Particle surface area is an important metric that we don't uh, regulate, but and and needs to be researched a lot more in terms of could this be a, a better way for us to uh, you know relate to health effects. The other thing to keep in mind is that these fine particles have a very large fraction of their mass as organic material. This can be semi-volatile organics that deposit on the surface of the particle, or they can actually be little oily droplets that are emitted from uh, tailpipes of cars, diesel trucks. Uh, not all particles have a, a solid core. Some of them are just little organic drops. However, we showed in an earlier study that when you strip the organics off the particle, 
uh, many of the cardiovascular effects that we measure are greatly diminished. So those organic components that are part of the uh, particles are really important. So we looked at uh, three hypotheses. The first hypothesis is that concurrent exposure to the mixture of concentrated particles and ozone will be more potent than the caps by itself with respect to increasing atherosclerosis, uh, with uh, patterns of heart rhythm and waveform uh, in terms of heart rate variability that are associated with adverse health effects. Um, and we also looked for evidence of uh, arterial wall thickening and damage to the arterial tissue. Uh, we uh, had a second hypothesis that the caps generated during the periods of high ambient photochemical activity will be chemically different than the caps uh, generated under other uh, conditions like fall, winter. So we basically contrasted uh, what happened in exposures where the aerosol came from a summer, spring uh, atmosphere and compare that to the same experiment, you know, same identical conditions, uh, matching concentrations as best we could, uh, but to particles during the fall or winter. And that would tell us about, uh, you know, whether these atmospheric interactions had a, played a role. And we also, uh, looked at what happens when you remove the organics if we saw changes or, or interactions between the ozone and particles we wanted to find out whether the interaction was dependent on having the organics present in other words did the ozone oxidize the organics and that's why there there's an interaction or was it more uh, something to do with ozone or some free radical being carried on the uh, denuded particle surface. So this is how we do our experiment. This is uh, an example of a device that can concentrate uh, particles out of ambient air. So we have a, a pump Uh, which is actually uh, or this you know we actually have a stack I'm sure this diagram we had a slight error here but this is just a stack we're sucking the air in we're putting it into a hydration zone so we have the ambient oh here we go ambient air coming in Okay, I didn't make it, mess it up. Okay, ambient air coming in. Uh, that ambient air is from a stack up above the roof of our building. So it's coming in from here. Uh, we have it in a hydrated chamber. So there's water down below. The particles come in above the water, mix with water vapor, and go up through a chiller. And what the chiller does is it condenses water vapor onto the particles. So particles smaller than uh, 15 nanometers and particles as big as two nanometers, uh, 2,000 nanometers rather, will grow and to a size where they have real inertia. And we focus those particles in a beam, which is shot up into a takeoff tube. So we're putting air in at the, coming into the system at about 100 liters a minute. We're sucking most of the air out on the side, but the particles 
because of their inertia, drive in a straight line and go into the takeoff tube where they go through a dryer and the water vapor is removed and they return to their, close to their original size distribution. It's amazing how close they actually come out. Uh, so we now have uh, PM 2.5 that is concentrated about tenfold <coughs> above the ambient level. We can, uh, so we have one arm of the experiment where PM 2.5 concentrated particles are exposing mice in a specially designed chamber. Now what's the, the special design of the chamber is that we used a computerized flow dyna fluid dynamic system so that we could actually show that we have uniform distribution of particles within each chamber so that the mice, even though they are, uh, we actually put nine mice in each of the chambers, but they're in little cubicles. And, but each cubicle gets the same amount of particles. So this, that, that development took quite a while to do. Also, it's hard to put in a simplistic diagram like this. The other arm, uh, we add ozone to the uh, concentrated ambient particles and we can expose another group of mice to the mixture of ozone and particles. And the mixing time here is very short. It's uh, really only about 20 or 30 seconds before the air gets to the chamber. And then of course we have uh, mice that are just being exposed to ozone by itself. So we have 200 ppb of ozone. We have uh, concentrated ambient particles with 200 ppb of ozone. And we have uh, mice exposed to uh, only particles. We implant the uh, mice with a, an electrocardiographic telemetry device. So this is a marvelous little device and it allows us to use a radio signal and we can actually collect the electrocardiographic data on a continuing basis during the exposure. Now, a mouse's heart beats about 500 times a minute compared to 60 or 70 for humans. So we really generate an awful lot of data. So we have to limit ourselves to how many data points we, we can actually look at. So I'm going to you know, show you snapshots uh, of the uh, electrocardiographs over time, I actually subject you to the, the actual things, but, but the results. And uh, so we picked some discrete intervals that help us identify what's going on. So the mice were exposed five hours a day, uh, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m., four days a week. Uh, and then for three days a week, uh, they were at rest, breathing purified air. Uh, they were, the entire experiment uh, was, or the exposure phase ran for eight weeks. We monitored uh, their cardiographic data throughout the experiment. And then I just have to mention that uh, all of this stuff is approved by our Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. And uh, we treat our animals very nicely. They all have toys to play with in their cages. They're fed ad lib. They have drinking water ad lib. However, they don't have food or water during the exposures, which is one of the reasons we try to, we don't do them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
Um, there are experiments where you can do that, but the, there's a problem with all of the food embedding, generating extraneous aerosol material. So we try to keep this as controlled as possible and our mice can tolerate the five hours a day well and four days a week, uh, you know, seem to uh, reduce stresses once they got used to what was happening. So I think the experiment was really good. Uh, we also wanted to get uh, both particle size and chemistry data on, on, this, on the experiment. And so we used an aerosol mass spectrometer. And the aerosol mass spectrometer, uh, some of you maybe you know, know about it, but what it is, is a device uh, that has a, an inlet for particles and it's under vacuum. So the particles are accelerated coming into uh, the chamber and then a rotating chopper splits this stream of particles into little blips. So this little, these little blips contain particles of all different sizes. And they're accelerated towards a, a capture unit and since the particles all have the same acceleration, the small particles move faster. And so the computer in the device keeps track of when the particles leave the chopper and how long the particle takes to hit the capture plate. And that is a measure of the particle size. So the faster it gets there, the smaller the particle. And then that particle is ablated thermally and then activated with an electric current and goes into a mass spectrometer where it's uh, bounced around using magnets and the uh, electrical ionization breaks those particles and the, the organics on the particles into small bits, which then are analyzed uh, in the mass spectrometer compared to a reference library. And we can get some idea of chemical composition based on the mass spectra that are produced. So, uh, another form of big data. This thing produces a mass spectrum for each particle. And then in order to make life a little bit manageable, we take the spectra and bin the particles by size categories and then look at the spectra, the average spectra for the particles of that size category. And that's how we can get a size specific uh, chemical composition measurement. So this machine is extremely valuable, extremely expensive and hard to use too, but uh, extremely valuable in, in terms of providing us with data specificity that we could not get by just looking at our mass collections of filters, which we also do. So we could get average composition, but this gives us composition on a minute by minute basis, which we can then correlate with minute by minute changes in biological endpoints. And so I'll be showing you some, some data for heart rate variability changes that are related back to the chemistry of the particles. So when you look at a heat map of the, the particles, as I said, we, we tend to have our particles, uh, even though we're, we're dealing with PM 2.5, uh, 
a large number of those particles are really small. And I put this up just to show you that uh, during the part of the day that we actually are doing our exposures, uh, obviously concentrations will change by the hour, but you can see that the uh, number of particles Uh, which is given by the, the color. So red is the most, uh, the highest amount of particles. Uh, you can see that the, the bulk of the particles are happening somewhere around the uh, 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock period. And we're doing our exposures throughout this period. So we're capturing the part of the day that gives us the highest exposure to particles. When we look at uh, the particles in terms of organics, it turns out, now this is uh, based on a mass measurement. So these are really uh, the size distribution uh, that you can look at as well. And so we find the highest mass of uh, particles uh, in terms of micrograms uh, per cubic meter spread up over the particle size range, which is given on the y-axis. So we're looking at particles from PM 2.5 in PM 2.5 from two and a half down to ten. And you can see from all these splats, there are organic constituents on all of these particles, but the biggest concentration are on the particles from say 200 to 600 nanometers. So in terms of our experiment, uh, we had particle concentrations of close to 100,000 particles uh, in the caps, uh, about 80 or 90,000 particles in the caps, about 85, 8.4 uh, times 10 to the fourth uh, particles in the mixture. And our ambient particles were uh, about 10 times less, which is exactly the design we were looking for concentrating the particles by about a factor of 10. So our mass concentration was on the order of about 130 uh, micrograms per cubic meter, again, higher than uh, ambient levels. Not unusual levels if you looked at uh, California history, and certainly not if you look at some uh, countries and some cities like Beijing or Mexico City. Uh, this would be considered a good day. Uh, in some of those places. And our ozone concentrations uh, were uh, well controlled. So when we look at the effects of, uh, of the exposures, now this is at the end of the eight week exposure, the animals are uh, killed and we harvest tissues and I'll show you a few of the things that we've measured. So these are analyses of arteries. And we're looking at the chemical composition of the plaques within those arteries. And what's interesting is, uh, first of all, uh, even the air exposed animals have some plaque and some lipids deposited. And again, that's the nature of this particular kind of animal. Uh, these knockout mice have circulating uh, cholesterol levels oops, uh, that are in the hundreds, probably four or 500, and almost all of it is low density uh, lipoproteins, the LDL cholesterol, which you know, we know is associated in humans with um, 
certainly more atherosclerosis. So these guys, we expected to see some plaque. What we found, though, was the CAPS exposure, they had less lipid and more collagen, indicating more fibrotic changes uh, in, in the uh, arterial plaque. And in the presence of ozone, we see even more uh, collagen. And there is possibly a, a, an interaction here. So uh, a plaque that has more collagen in it is considered a more mature and possibly more dangerous kind of plaque because as arteries expand and contract, these plaques are, are stressed. And if they become too rigid, they start to crack. And that's when you have disruption of the plaque and that could lead eventually to uh, release of, of particles that could block other arteries and cause uh, heart attacks or strokes. So there is, you know, some evidence for, you know, interaction, interactive changes. Now, we, I mentioned heart rate variability and what we'll be looking at here is an analysis of the variation between the beats the normal beats. So it's, you know, this time interval is a little bit longer than this time interval. And this time interval is sort of intermediate. So there's normal variation. With every pair of heartbeats, there'll be a, a difference. So we can measure uh, statistical, uh, you know, statistically, uh, you know, what is this variation and how does it change over time? So we're going to look at two ways of measuring heart rate variability. One is dependent on just a simple statistical uh, time dependent uh, measure. So what this is, is the root mean square of successive differences. So you take heartbeat one and heartbeat two, you get a difference. And then you take heartbeat two and heartbeat three, you get another successive, you know, that would be a successive difference. And you take the root mean square of those successive differences. So that means you square the differences add them up, and then take the square root. So this is a uh, time-dependent measure of variability. And this measure has been shown to be simp uh, 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 representative of changes in the autonomic nervous system's parasympathetic tone. So parasympathetic influences are the opposite of the sympathetic influences. So let's start with that. When you're frightened, you get an adrenaline rush. Adrenaline causes your heart to speed up, your breathing to speed up, your arteries to close down. Uh, it's the prototypical uh, flight or fright mechanism. That is moderated by the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is the yin to the sympathetic system's yang. Basically, these are influences that slow down the heart. Obviously, these are two things that have to work in concert. There are times when you want your heart to speed up. There are times when you want your heart to slow down. And all that is really not something that you control. That's, you know, it is an autonomic system 
you don't really consciously control these things. It's controlled by uh, hormones and mediators that are produced by the nerves in the brain. And so what we see here is that uh, parasympathetic influences uh, might be triggered by a change in the lung that then releases mediators that tend to slow the heartbeat. And these things are moving along at a pretty fast clip. So what we're looking at here is the changes in uh, the RMSSD, the root mean square standard deviation, over the eight week exposure period. And in order to put this on a simple graph, each animal has its own, has its own curve. They're all, you know, each animal started out as different, even though they're bred from the same colony and they're really, really close cousins. And they have very similar genetics. Their epigenetics are, are different. And so, what we do is we establish a baseline for each mouse before we start the experiment. Now that's important because a couple of things. One is you take a mouse out of its cage and it's kind of crazy. It's, it's very, you know, it gets upset, you know, first couple of times. Um, its autonomic nervous system is probably just as jumbled. So we have to acclimate the mice to our experiment. And that takes you know, a week or so, just taking them out of the cage, putting them in our chambers for a couple of hours and a few more hours. And we build them up, kind of improve their tolerance to being manipulated. Then we start monitoring their electrocardiograms. And once we get a stable level in the electrocardiogram for that particular mouse, we can then establish a baseline level. So what I'm showing you in this graph are baseline levels for, or differences from the baseline level of each mouse, and we're at averaging them for the entire group. Now, the entire group is five animals. So they're each animal with its own baseline level. And we have four different exposure groups. So we've got the air, the caps, the mixture, and the ozone alone. And what you can see is a couple of things. One is there's a real separation between the caps by itself and the caps or I'm sorry the caps by itself is the orange line it shows up differently all right so this is the caps by itself down here this is the ozone by itself down here this is the mixture and this is the air so the mixture is responding differently Now, the other thing that's interesting is that when you look at what happens over the course of the experiment, things are, you know, kind of flat for each group till you get out to six weeks. At the end of six weeks, we start to see a more progressive change, which leads me to believe that we should have gone this, done this experiment for 16 weeks or, or more to really see what happens. But, you know, it's hard to go back in time. But this does show you that there could be progressive changes uh, from the ozone. The progression is less marked for the particles by itself. And the mixture, uh, although it didn't show much earlier on, was beginning to show a, a, a downtrend. Now in humans, 
reduction in heart rate variability is associated with adverse cardiovascular events. So this is moving in a more adverse direction. Uh, the other measure I'm going to show you is high frequency heart rate variability. Now, high frequency means that we take the data and so we have hundreds of thousands of data points for each mouse. And what we do is we run it through a computer program that separates out high frequency changes from low frequency changes and then looks at those separately and then takes those high frequency changes and calculates heart rate variability for high frequency and takes heart rate variability for low frequency. So high frequency heart rate variability has also been associated with parasympathetic uh, influences. So decreases in high frequency, which is you know, the speeding up of the heart part, if you decrease that part of it, you tend to show a lower uh, heart rate variability. So here is high frequency HRV. And again, you can see that the caps and ozone are below the air and mixture until you get to like week seven. So uh, again, I don't know whether this will make any, will, will follow out and show us more trends in longer studies. So our current study, which is a little bit different, is not involving ozone, but we will be looking at effects of CAPS over longer periods of time. And we will be looking at boy mice and girl mice to look at that. So that's a story that we will be telling you soon. Anyway, uh, we're going to look at uh, a little more detail. So we can look at uh, evidence of changes in the electrocardiograms from the early part of the heartbeat. So this would be a kind of a typical heartbeat uh, uh, where you have uh, P, Q, R, S, T uh, kind of pattern. So. Uh, when you look at this part of the wave versus the latter part, these tell you different things about the way the heart is functioning. So we looked at the P wave duration, which is an indicator of changes during the atrial part, the first part of the heartbeat. So this is sort of where the heart is filling. And what you can see is that there are significant changes uh, in, in the duration of that P wave. Now, this shows four different time points. So now we're looking at what happens over the course of the, you know, of the time after these animals are exposed. So this first point is what we see immediately after exposure. And it shows a very, you know, relatively small change. That evening, so somewhere between seven and, and midnight, we can see uh, you know, that there's more of a change. The non-exposure days, so this is, so these would be measurements taken Monday through Thursday and average for those time periods. These are data, uh, the green and yellow are data for the non-exposure days, so 
Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So now we're looking at uh, a day and a half or a couple of days later. And the, so the, during the afternoons of the non-exposure days, uh, we had more of an effect. And then at night, the yellow line shows a very large effect. And you can see the, uh, these effects are, are happening uh, with the ozone uh, plus CAPS group, uh, a little bit with the CAPS group, a little bit with the, you know, and the same with the ozone group. So this, you know, the non-exposure night. So there's a residual effect that their P, P waves are wider uh, after ozone exposure. So ozone seems to be affecting the atrial part of the heartbeat. If you take the organics away, uh, there's not much, you know, very small effects. So kind of confirming that organics are important. But there is something there. And we're going to start dissecting that out. But uh, it's yet another interesting thing to think about for future work. OK, now this is the QT interval. So this is the part of the heartbeat when it's pushing blood out, when the heart's pushing blood out. And what you see here is that you have a lengthening of the QT interval in the caps exposed animals. You have a decrease in that interval in the ozone exposed animals. And again, the ozone exposed animals seem to shorten that ventricular part or shorten the uh, yeah, the ventricular part. So what does it mean if you have more rapid ventricular changes? Uh, you know, in extreme cases, that would be ventricular fibrillation, or VFib, which is a medically important phenomenon, as is the changes that occur in the atrial node. So in one case, we're looking at particles may have you know, an effect that affects the atrial part of the heartbeat and may be associated with AFib, whereas the ozone may be associated with VFib. And when we mix these things together and just look at the overall heart rate variability, some of these changes would have canceled out which may explain why our mixture heart rate variability looked like there was nothing going on until we got to the end of the experiment. Now, I want to point out that these last couple of graphs are the averages over the entire experiment. So as you saw in those time charts, the early part wasn't as, uh, you know, wasn't as important and might have actually diluted out some of the effects. Whereas in the latter part, we started to see some real differences uh, due to the exposures. So again, um, this is our average. And we put these in because when we go back to look at the plaques and relate them, they are going to be uh, more uh, involved with that. So I want to look at the seasonal effects. I'm going to kind of talking more than I should have. Uh, but anyway, when we look at heart rate or the beat to beat interval, which is the inverse of heart rate, uh, we're, we're showing that during the summer we have a larger interval, slower heart rate than during the winter. We have a larger P wave duration than during the, well, actually fall, but 
uh, these changes were significant and these were not. Uh, and then during the summer, uh, the, the uh, back end, the Q wave interval was bigger, but we didn't see anything in the fall. So suggesting that the particles during the high photochemical activity period had something else going on that was not there in the uh, later period. And we've uh, talked a little bit about uh, summer uh, being a little bit different. And when we look at the uh, ventricular uh, related uh, changes. So this is one another measure. We, we have looked at uh, the T wave. We, you know, we looked at the Q and the P. This, this is uh, related to the T part of the curve, which is sort of the very end and, and the period where the heart is beginning to uh, get ready for the next beat. Uh, we do see some changes, again, the summer different than the fall. So I wanted to show chemical composition to show uh, one of the things that we saw, and I still working on explaining this, but when we mixed the ozone with the particles, which are what we're showing here, and these are mass concentrations of various components, we show that the inorganic components are, are pretty well identical. There seems to be a slight decrease in organic components. And we had shown previously that uh, the fine particles, which make up a lot of the organic, the organics down here are chemically different than the larger particle organics. And one of the big changes that we saw was there were lower oxygen to carbon ratios here than here. So we had shown that changes in oxygen to carbon ratio were related to heart rate variability. And so we looked at it uh, in terms of uh, the caps or the mixture and sure enough, you do see that there is lower heart rate variability. And this is, uh, we're looking only at the high frequency uh, HRV, again, parasympathetic influence. But we're seeing a decrease, you know, that the lower values in heart rate variability, which are, you know, the ones associated with more adverse, uh, adverse effects, are increase, you know, are, are related to the lower O to, o to C ratio in the particles. And that held up whether we added ozone or not. But we can use the uh, AMS to tease out specific classes of compounds. So here we're looking at compounds uh, that have uh, double bonds, uh, aldehydes and ketones which are biological reactive, biologically reactive. And what we're showing is heart rate variability goes down as concentration of aldehydes and ketones in the particles go up. So this is suggesting that these types of compounds uh, could be playing a role in, in health effects. On the other hand, in particles where we had increases in organic acids, so the typical progression of, you know, in organic chemistry, you learn is you start out with something like an alcohol, which is lightly oxidized. You oxidize it, and it becomes an aldehyde or a ketone. And if you oxidize it more, it becomes an acid. Well, organic acids, are much less biologically active than aldehydes and ketones. And so not surprisingly, we find that heart rate variability moves in the upper direction. The changes are, are positive, 
uh, as the amount of acids in the particle goes up. But this is the, 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 the final real data slide. And what you can see down here is we measured these effects. You know, again, the high frequency heart rate variability, we measured them on different days. And the ambient temperature on those days was different. And when we plot the data, we find heart rate variability is worse or, or lower on the warmer days. Again, we do these in isolation, so our mice are never seeing ambient temperature. They're always at a constant temperature, they're at 70 degrees. So the outside air temperature has nothing to do with the mice, has everything to do with what's happening when the particles are being formed. So again, warmer days, you tend to have more photochemical activity. And it seems like those particles are more, photo, you know, more activated and may have more of a biological effect. So if this is representative of some of the changes we might see in global warming, uh, there's a possibility that global warming could be bad for your health, among other things. So to conclude our effects, we can't really say that the effects of the mixture were worse. However, I want to point out that this is one specific mixture. We might have gotten different result if we used lower or higher amounts of ozone, lower or higher amounts of particles. Uh, we did see chemical differences. It showed that uh, when you oxidize, uh, some of these things to aldehydes, uh, the presence of aldehydes is indicative of more health effects. And we found that caps generated in the air during periods of high photochemical activity may be more biologically active than those that were generated during the lower period, lower photochemical period. And we didn't really demonstrate that uh, removing the organics uh, from the particles changed the way the particles interacted with the ozone. However, uh, that's a story we, we still need to examine a lot more closely. The other thing that, uh, you know, is new and different is that we're now seeing that you can't just look at the total heart rate variability. We really have to look at what part of the heartbeat is being changed because that has a lot of bearing on human disease and human uh, outcomes. And finally, that uh, daily changes in ambient uh, temperature may have a role. You know, it may just be that photochemistry is different but it may actually, there may actually be something to do with uh, when the particles are warmed up, they're more reactive. And of course, if we have more extremes in our weather, we're going to have more things like wildfires. And wildfires definitely generate a lot of ultrafine particles and fine particles that can have uh, adverse effects too. So I want to thank the uh, Resources Board and I also want to thank uh, National Science Foundation and our group from Air UCI for helping us with the AMS measurements. Um, we have a whole group of people that really worked and slaved on these projects, on the, on, especially on this project. And I really appreciate all their help. And the Air Resources Board is in no way responsible for any of the things I've said today. So. I'm open to questions. Yes. All right. Oh, sorry. Um, if you could introduce yourself and um, state where where you're from, and before and for this is for the online audience. We just need to make sure they're on the microphone. Hi, I'm Andy Rubin with the excuse me with the Human Health Assessment Branch at DPR. Um, Understanding that the mammalian heart is myogenic, 
I'm wondering if, in other words, there's a basal heartbeat, whether there's parasympathetic or sympathetic innervation, um, whether you might be able to tease out some of the autonomic effects by working on animals that have been surgically, their, which their hearts have been surgically denervated. I, re I recognize that's a, that might be a complicated surgical procedure, but if there was an effect on the basic contractile properties of the heart, you might be able to approach it that way. It's a very interesting possibility. And uh, we have looked at uh, the possibility of at least, you know, uh, taking out, uh, because we, we're starting from the top and looking at what happens in the lung, you know, and, and how that propagates. So we were thinking of ablating C fibers in the lung to see you know, and working our way down. But certainly, yeah, I don't know enough about being able to denervate, you know, the, the cardiovascular system, but, you know, certainly, uh, you know, they do it with humans, so, you know, we could use similar things. And I am teamed up with a uh, surgical cardiologist, and we're working on a uh, myocardial infarction model now. And uh, I, I'll suggest to him, uh, you know, going in that direction. Thank you. Um, Svetlana Kuzlukova from DPR. What was the rationale of using, of exposing mice for four days? Oh, four days a week? Yes. Um, well, the typical air pollution episode used to be, you know, three to four days, and then you'd, you know, it'd go away. Um, we wanted a period of exposure, non-exposure. Uh, we've found in the past, especially with ozone, continuous exposure may lead to some structural changes, but a lot of the physiological things, like changes in heart rate, uh, breathing patterns, and uh, we assume other things, tend to uh, get lessened, and it you know, we have found, you know, in our experience, giving the animals a recovery period uh, allows them to become, you know, regain some relative sensitivity. And what we see, you know, for example, when we start looking at, uh, you know, some of these parameters over the course of the, the week, they kind of go down, 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 down. And then we can see over the weekend, there's some improvement but they don't recover all the way. And then they, you know, so if I plotted this thing out in, you know, a big scale, you'd kind of see a sawtooth pattern, which may tell us a lot about, you know, something about recovery and non-recovery. But the main thing I wanted to avoid was, uh, you know, this overstressing and also uh, wiping out uh, the sensitivity uh, due to continuous ozone exposure. Hi there, I'm Julian McCall with the Senate Office Research. Pardon my voice. Um, <clears throat> without having done the experiments, would you, would you anticipate similar or exacerbated effects in juvenile developing mice? In, in uh, uh, juvenile in young, young mice. Uh, we have not, you know, done uh, juvenile mice to that extent. Uh, we are doing some pilot work on uh, starting out with neonatals, you know, and also in utero exposures. And we are going to start looking at that. But juvenile mice are, you know, a little more fragile. And, you know, keeping them out of food and water over long periods of time get, you know, would be hard to sell to my committee, so I need a, a, a better way to do exposures, uh, you know, or, or, or go into, you know, one of these other whole body types of things. But we can, you know, what I think is really important is uh, in utero exposure, whether these animals will come out with epigenetic changes 
that are going to predispose them to health effects later in life. And we've had a, a smattering of data that suggests there are things that do change, uh, not only in the respiratory and cardiac effects, but uh, we've seen changes in the brain from in utero exposures. So it's a really important area. I need, you know, I need a, a bigger team. I, you know, I, I, I am working at getting a, more colleagues to, to help with these things. But thank you for the question. Hi, my name is Eric Migalino. I'm from the, the Water Board. Um, this is more of a, a question of clarification. The atrial tachycardia and the ventricular tachycardia that you saw, were they independent of one another? Or did you find that, because you mentioned in, on your conclusions that you would like to look at them separately, the, the atrial tachy, I mean, the ventricular tachycardia is what you want to look at separately. But did you not find them correlating with each other? I was just curious. Where, well, it looks like the driving forces are, are different. You know, that the ozone is affecting the autonomic system in a different way than the particles seem to be. And again, this is a, you know, that was not something we planned the experiment to, to look at. So this is, you know, an advent, you know, you know, a finding of opportunity. And, you know, it's something we will, you know, go into a little more. Uh, one of the things that uh, I've been trying to sell to some of my epidemiology colleagues is to actually start looking at whether the incidence of AFib uh, and VFib vary seasonally. So that, uh, you know, would you see that in human populations during the summer, you'd see more uh, AFib versus during the latter part of the year might seem more VFib, you know, which would have been, you know, driven by different components in the air pollution. So there are ways to, to look at this. And as I said, this was sort of a, you know, a, an opportunistic finding. And uh, we are working with, uh, you know, some software people to help us actually tease out a little bit more detail if we can. But you know, we have a data bank, and we're, you know, we'll be mining it as much as we can, open to anybody else who has great ideas to mine the data. Well, I'd, li I'd like to suggest that you might want to look at the, the hemoglobin. Yeah. Because the thing is, the oxygen, I mean, that might be a compensatory response to the oxygen, oxygen carrying capacity. Yeah. So. Yeah, one of the things that we did think about was looking at uh, oxygenation and look for evidence of ischemia. And, you know, there are ways of doing it. Um, and we certainly could have, but, you know, we were, a li you know, li we limited ourselves because uh, there were just so many hours in the day that I could make my graduate students work. Absolutely. Excellent presentation. I tried for 40. <laughs> Excellent presentation, by the way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. That was a great uh, talk. Um, I was curious about the the relationship between uh, temperature and heart rate variability that you found. I, I don't remember seeing that in the literature before, but but is that is that a, a finding that that has been seen before? And uh, I, to my knowledge, no one has reported that. And this was you know this was a finding that. We looked at it and said, nah. <laughs> and then we got more data, and it, and it seems to be holding up. So we have data from several previous years. And I think you know, if we analyze the larger data set, uh, there's a possibility that we can find, uh, you know, find out whether this is true. But again, this experiment was not designed to look at that, yeah. and a, it would be amazing to really sit down and look at that, and then add, you know look at other relevant endpoints as well. And you know it's it's um, it's interesting in that uh, you know uh, 
increased temperatures um, put a strain on the heart, and they're a risk factor for you know, ischemic heart heart events. So it, it'd be interesting to see that, um, you know, to, to what extent that you know this. I mean, certainly the temperature's going to play a uh, just the ambient temperature on a person is going to well, play again, an event, the, and then the, the, you know the, this the, is I, also. I got to point out that my mice never see ambient temperature. Yeah. They're under controlled conditions from the time we breed them to the time we dispose of them, you know, and, and harvest them. So the, any of these changes that we're seeing are changes that are occurring on the particle. And so that's an area that, you know, can certainly be looked at. We've got air filters, you know, you know not just us, but, you know, you guys have air filters and a library of filters that are available. And um, it might be very fascinating to start, if I can identify specific chemical changes in these that we've already linked to cardiovascular disease, then to go back to your, you know, historical fil filters, put those together with an epidemiological database and really see if, you know, this holds up. I, the, the, the mice are very convincing, but I don't know about people. Uh, I'm Morteza Amini from uh, Research Division of ARB. Uh, I have a question. Uh, is there any way that we can uh, differentiate and separate the effect of ultrafine particles from, uh, PM, from larger particles in your measurement? Uh, to differentiate them? The effects of ultrafine ultra particles, yeah. as, as, I mean, specifically. Well, we've, we've actually done experiments where we separate the ultrafine particles and do exposures to PM2.5 versus the ultrafines. And when we do that, the ultrafine fraction, uh, you know, if, if you analyze it on a per milligram basis, are way more toxic. However, they have a lot fewer milligrams. So when you look at epidemiological data and try to associate ultrafines with health effects, unless you do something like, uh, you know, looking at specific locations, you know, near roadways, for example, uh, when you try to, uh, you know, use the normal, you know, sighting for uh, air quality measurements, you get a correlation to PM2.5, and you get no correlation to ultrafines. And I think part of that is the way we measure, you know, mass and, you know, is not quite the right measurement. Number is extremely variable. It varies not only spatially, but temporally. And I've, I've got a great slide of showing a plume coming out of a smokestack. And you can see it starts out with a lot of ultrafine particles. As it moves downwind, you get even more ultrafine particles. And then the ultrafine particles start to disappear as they mix together and agglomerate. So it's a very dynamic thing. And anything I do you know, in the lab is a snapshot. You know, I'm looking at this, this cross section right now. And eventually, we need more cross sections and we can make a 3D model out of it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, Mark Hans from DPR. Any idea what's happening to all these particles? Are they being trapped in the alveoli? Good question. So uh, it. I mean, is, yeah. No. Is, they, is, that, uh, is there a mechanism to get them out of the alveoli? I know it bypasses a lot of the, uh, the mechanisms to particles out of the lung when it gets that far into the lung. So, um, you know, the lung itself, right, is a, has a, a, a tremendous air cleaning capacity because when you look at all that branching, you know, each, you know, you have the bronchi, you know, breaking off into two and then each one breaks into more and you get, it's almost like a tree, right, or a root system. And as you go down, those branches get narrower, 
and the angles get steeper. And so as particles move down various locations, the bigger particles have more inertia, they tend to you know, deposit. The really small particles don't deposit by inertia, they, they bounce around on, on air molecules. So they deposit more by diffusion. So they tend to be, you know, move down and they do deposit very efficiently. Uh, you know, that, you know, when I showed that uh, size map where you saw the, that big red blob in the middle, if I plotted a, put up on, on a plot, the deposition in the respiratory tract, that's the size it deposits preferentially in the deep lung. However, it also deposits you know, along the track and you know, efficiently in the head. So big particles, more in the upper respiratory tract, medium-sized stuff along the airways, and then down in the alveolar ridge. Now, the alveoli are protected by a, a, an epithelial coating and surfactants. And they are patrolled by mobile macrophages that crawl around in there. And the macrophages actually can pick up particles and carry them out. Uh, now, their, their main design is to eat bacteria and viruses and digest those, and get rid of them, or trigger the immune system to you know, have an effect. But they can carry them out either up the bronchi and you swallow them, or they can tunnel out and get into the lymph system. And so if you look at the lung of somebody who's lived in a, in a city for years, and you look at the outside, there'll be these little black spots where all the lymph nodes are. And those are carbonaceous, insoluble materials that were breathed in and are now transported and sequestered in those lymph nodes. And so, yeah, the, the lung tends to clean itself. And it's a matter of you know, time. So if the particles are there long enough to damage the underlying tissue, uh, you can have you know, effects, you can have fibrosis, you have all sorts of things. Uh, you know, so there are, I guess it's a, a long-winded way of saying, yeah, the lung cleans itself, but, but uh, it, th there are plenty of things that can get down there and cause damage uh, because uh, you know, clearance mechanisms take a certain amount of time. And if the ultrafines, when they get down there, burrow into the interstitial tissue, they can be there for a really long time. Oh. Uh, I had another follow-up. Uh, if you exceed the capacity of the alveoli to... Uh... If you ex uh, exceed the capacity of the alveoli to um, rid the smaller particles, Aren't you affecting the ability of the lung to take in oxygen? Well, so how does the, the what happens in the alveoli? Uh, when you have things that get in there, especially things that ir particles tend to irritate the surface, and that causes uh, that surface to change and actually thicken. So you, you can see after you know, especially, you know, something like ozone, which is a really strong irritant, uh, you can see it pretty rapidly. You can see the walls of the alveoli, which are normally like one cell thick, and then an interstitial layer becomes multi, multiply uh, thickened, and the interstitium gets expanded because inflammatory cells start coming in because they sense an injury and they actually come in, so macrophages and neutrophils come out of, the, out of the bloodstream, out of the vasculature, migrate through and get into the interstitial tissues. And you can see that those things are really thick and puffy. And so oxygen transport is, can be diminished. So- Would that cause the heart rate to increase? Uh, it can, yeah. yeah there, there's a disease in birds, the exposure to uh molecule called bloom. It gets all the way into the alveoli. It's very difficult for the people to uh, eradicate. 
And one, one of the symptoms is you get a, a low blood level of oxygen. And if you don't eliminate exposure, you'll get, uh, eventually you can get fibrosis and need a lung transplant. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and, and people, and you know, it, and it, uh, you, you know, start you off with a dry cough and you get weakness and it's, it's quite a problem. But uh, the, the, the main issue with that is it gets in the alveoli and it's very difficult to, to get it out of there. Yeah, the other thing is that uh, when these things happen, uh, you impair the immune system, and then, you know, we're breathing bacteria and viruses all the time, and our body can eliminate it. The immune system can, can deal with that. But if you weaken the immune system or you suppress it, uh, then those things have a chance to also fulminate down in the lung. And that's where you start to get more susceptibility to uh, lung infections and pneumonia and things like that which epidemiologically you can show there are associations with uh, air pollution exposure. And then if you really want to look at extreme cases, you look at some of these guys, uh, you know, lungs from mining situations or that work uh, with high level diesel exposures. And you look at their lungs and you can clearly see structural changes. You can see macrophages that are just full of black stuff um, you know, it, so in extreme cases, you can have some serious injury. Okay, it looks like we have a question from online, so I'm going to go ahead and read off the question. Okay. Let's see. This is from Stephen Rinkus of CDPR. Yeah. And the question is, were breathing rates monitored to see if these rates remain the same among the different treatment groups. I'm thinking how irritants, e.g. by HCHO or acrolein, cause a decrease in breathing in mice. LRE RD50 testing. Well, hi, Steve. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, our, our system uh, was, for in this experiment, were electrocardiographs only. We've now shifted to a, uh, a system where we're getting uh, pressure measurements, and from that we can get respiratory rate. So we, in the future, will be able to uh, see if there are differences in respiration, you know, respiratory rate. However, uh, you know, as you've alluded, in human human studies, uh, humans exposed to relatively low levels of ozone. Uh, do have uh, a much more rapid and more shallow respiration rate. And that's uh, reflex uh, driven, uh, similar to what uh, Allery uh, had, had shown uh, years ago. So uh, I would not be surprised to see it. But our measurements of heart, heartbeat uh, or heart rate, which is often correlated with respiratory rate uh, might give us some indication. And we found in the PM exposed animals, uh, their respiratory rate actually uh, was uh, lower. So they're, they had a higher beat to beat interval. So, and part, so that is more typical of let me see, I think ozone is more of a deep lung irritant and particles must be operating in the upper respiratory tract. So I think they're, you know, different fibers are being triggered. But thanks for the question. Any other questions from the audience? If not, if you please help me thank Mike Kleinman for a very informative talk. Thank you, Mike. Thank you.